I want to preach this morning on the thought of a call to prayer. A call to prayer. First, Second Chronicles chapter 7, beginning in verse 11. If you would be standing as we read, we're not reading very long. You can sit back down. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all that came into Solomon's heart to make in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he prosperously effected. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You may be seated. If you look back at this passage of Scripture, for time's sake I didn't read the entire chapter, you would see that they, uh, within the first verses of this chapter, the dedication of, of the temple that Solomon had built. <clears throat> David had desired to build the temple. He wanted to be the one to build it, but God wouldn't allow it. And God said, you've been a man of war, a man of blood. And so no matter how bad you want to do this, and even though I may appreciate your effort and your desire, it is for Solomon to build this temple. It was not God's plan or God's timing. And so Solomon follows through with the plan of God. And we see in these first few verses that they, when they had finished praying, that the fire came and consumed the sacrifice that was there. And the Bible says that the people then said, for he is good, uh, for his mercy endureth forever. They sacrificed 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. They dedicated the central area, and then they had seven days of, of a festival celebrating the temple and celebrating what God had done. And then they had a closing ceremony on the eighth day. And the Bible tells us that the people went home. It doesn't say it necessarily like this, but the people went home happy. So they went home and everything had went according to plan. God was pleased and the people were pleased and they went home happy. That sounds like a good revival, doesn't it? The last night of revival and everything for us, we usually concluded on Sunday and we'll dismiss Sunday's service and then, and then we'll have a dinner afterward. And so we have church and no evening service and everybody got their bellies full and everybody goes home happy. And so they had all went after their all days meeting, they'd went home. That's an old term. Some of you don't even know what that is. They had went home happy. And in verse 11, God is speaking to Solomon. And we believe, and I know that you believe as well, in the sovereignty of God, that God is in control of all things. I, amen? amen? God does not send. Some people will say, well, God doesn't send bad things. He doesn't send bad things into my life or into this. Well, we're going to get into semantics about what you're calling sending or allowing. Because if you don't think that God will allow bad things to happen, then ask Noah why he had to build an ark. God sent the flood. God sent the judgment. And so we can ask Noah if God will allow bad things or send bad things or things that we consider to be bad. <clears throat> we can also ask Jonah if God allowed bad things to happen. I don't have time to go into all these Bible stories. You can even ask the Apostle Paul if God will allow bad things to happen. But whether God sends it or whether God allows it, He is Lord and He is in control. Amen. Because he allows or sends things into our lives that he may send correction, that he may teach us patience, <coughs> that he might give us direction, and ultimately that he might receive his glory. Amen. He may send these things uh, that we don't want. And this is what I want to preach on this morning. He may do that in order to call us to prayer. 
How many would admit this morning you don't have to raise your hand and you don't have to yell out loud? How many will admit you pray more when things are going bad and you need God to do something? When we had our uh, candlelight service here uh, a couple of months ago, <coughs> I know that, I know Hannah, maybe even Tabby had mentioned, uh, again, one or both, had mentioned about their kids praying and understanding what's going on because of what Darcy is going through. Now, nobody would sign up for that or volunteer for that. But the reality is them going through that has, has called all of us to pray even more. <coughs> Somebody pray for me this morning. <coughs> I'm still getting over this thing from a few weeks ago. We see that these things will call us to prayer. Across the nation, some of you aren't old enough to remember this, but when 9-11 happened, there was a call to prayer throughout all the nation from government officials, from even celebrities in the media calling people to pray. COVID happened. And what did people ask us to do? What did they ask the church to do? They called on us to pray. Prayer is a rallying cry and it gathers the people. And life change, thank God, is a church of prayer. Whether you realize it or not, because of your willingness to pray, because of your willingness to reach out to people and let them know we're praying for them, because of your willingness to get on our messenger thread and let everyone know that someone needs prayer, because of your willingness to literally get on your knees and pray, that people know when they need a prayer through, they can get a hold of Life Change Church. There's no greater compliment Amen. that people can give you as a church, not me, not Bethany, but you, that people say, I need prayer. Let's get a hold of life change. <coughs> For years, Beach Fork was known, and still is known, don't take that wrong, <coughs> as a church that when somebody needed something, they would begin to say, get a hold of Beach Fork because we want them to pray. Get a hold of this person. Get a hold of Rubyville. Get a hold of those others. Because needs rally us to prayer. And so if we look at this scripture, we see this morning that number one, that we have to, if we expect God to move, and we expect God, because that's what he's saying. Solomon, if you find yourself in this situation, these things are happening. And he said, these are things that I send your way because of circumstances, if you will do these things, well, now here's the part of the preaching nobody likes. If you'll do these things, I will answer your prayer. In 2024, all anybody wants to hear is God saying, I will do whatever you want me to do. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but no matter how I'm living, Lord, I want you to do whatever it is that I want you to do. Like a genie in a bottle, God, I've got three wishes. <coughs> I hope you give me a good job. I wish that you'd heal my body, and I wish you'd do this. But God says there's conditions here. <clears throat> Number one, we have to realize. We have to realize. What does that mean? It means we have to humble ourselves. It means you or myself, as hard as this is for us to admit, are not in charge. It means, and some of us will not like to hear this, the world does not revolve around us. How many of you ever told your kids that? How many of you, you say, how many of you ever heard that from your parents? The world does not revolve around us. 
And so we have to realize that when things are happening, that it might not be what we like and it may not be what we desire, but it is because God in the greater good is trying to do something that may not even be about us. And so we have to be willing to step back and to allow God to move and to humble ourselves and say, I don't always know what's best. This is not what I prayed for. This is not what I wanted to happen. But I'm going to lower myself and realize that God is in charge and that God is good and God is great and God knows what he's doing. I heard my father-in-law many years ago say this in a message, but he was, he was saying this from the point of a pharmacist. I don't know if he remembers saying this or if he's, maybe it was something he said all the time, so he maybe he does remember it. When you get your medication, there's, it, you're supposed to take it by what it says, right? How many times you're supposed to take it? And especially something like antibiotic, you're supposed to take it Till here, till it's gone. And what I heard him say was this. If you're not going to do what the doctor says to do, then don't go to the doctor. Amen. All right? Well, there's times where we want God to do this and to do that. And, and if you're not going to trust what God is going to do, then there's no need to pray and ask God to do anything. We must pray humbling ourselves that, Lord, this is my desire. And it's not, I'm not saying you can't do it, but, Lord, I'll trust you no matter the result of my prayer and no matter the result of what you bring into my life. Lord, I will humble myself and realize. Do you understand that word? I will recognize, realize that, that you are in charge. And I am simply living the life that you want and accepting whatever comes my way from you. The world, what we don't understand is that we are raising generations of kids to think that everything is about them because TikTok tells them everything's about them. Social media has told everything is about them. And if somebody hurts your feelings or somebody tells you something you don't like, then they must be wrong. I'm not saying that we couldn't use that, that my parents and grandparents couldn't use a little sensitivity training. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying there wasn't some things that we could improve upon, but I don't remember James McCain, my grandpa, asking me how it made me feel when he told me what to do. Amen. He just said do it, and he expected it to be done. My dad was a little more tender, but trust me, there wasn't a lot of conversations about what he wanted me to do. He expected it to be done, whether it hurt my feelings because they recognized that the truth was more important in my life than what my feelings are. And you'll tell someone the truth if you love them. And so we hear things like trigger words and feelings and so on, and, and we think that it's everyone else's responsibility that everything and everybody else in the world, that their main focus should to be to make sure that I am okay in everything instead of simply speaking the truth into people's lives. And whatever happens, happens. We have to realize we need him. The Israelites at times became so arrogant to the point that they forgot who made them what they were. And that is what God is reminding Solomon of. Because think of this, I've preached on this scripture, every, every preacher probably has, and if you've been preaching a long time, probably preached on it a lot of times, but one thing I had never thought about before, do you understand how, I can see why they would become arrogant, did you listen to what I said? They sacrificed 22,000 oxen, they sacrificed 120,000 sheep. They had just built a temple laden with gold and I could go on and on about all the furnishings and all the spectacular things about the temple. You would be easy to sit back and say, look at all that we have. How many sheep did they have? How many oxen did they have if they could afford to sacrifice all of that? 
They were above and abundantly, overly blessed, and it would be easy to step back and say, look at all that we have obtained. All our hard work has given us. Are we proud of ourselves? But God is reminding Solomon that when you get in trouble, the first thing you're going to have to do is humble yourselves and recognize, realize that I am in charge. Physical pain, death, financial burdens, all things that we've all dealt with at times in our lives, they humble us very, very quickly. As a, as a husband and as a father, it's, it's my responsibility to provide for my family. And, you know, when <laughs> we look back at times, I don't know, you have to at least be a, a certain age to be able to do this, but you look back and you think of when we first got married and when the kids were really little and I look back and it'll be pictures of us on vacation or something. And I'm like, I'll think, I don't remember how we even had enough money. To, I don't know how we did that. You know, I, I'm not sure how, where that came from. or I'm not sure how, but, but those times humble us and prepares us for the blessings that will come later on when we realize and we can appreciate and say, you know what? I was the same person back then when I didn't have anything. Everything that I have, everything that I've obtained, and I love that song that they sang because they, we were talking to me and thanking you, Lord, and thanking him for his blessings. And I was sitting there this morning. I was looking up here as they were singing. And no offense, it's what the, the blessing wasn't about them. <laughs> but it was, it was because most of the time I'm up here doing this or I'm up here singing or at least singing with somebody. But I was just sitting there and looking up at this church and looking at what God has done and, and listening to them sing and and, and just everything that God has provided us here and everything that he has blessed us with. And I remember when there was nothing and then there was even no hope, no hope in my life, no hope in my ministry. Nothing was there. And I had to really humble myself and say, Lord, I know that I can't do anything within myself, but God had a plan and he was going to, he was going to do something that I could not even anticipate what he was going to do. But we have to recognize that it is him. I've got to move on. Number two, not only do we realize, but we have to recognize. Because he says, if my people which are called by my name shall, number one, humble, realize, humble themselves, and pray and seek my face. And so we have to recognize who it is. If it's not us, if we humble ourselves and say, Lord, it's not me, then we have to recognize who it is that we need to look to and it's his face and recognize where our help comes from when we seek his face. The Bible tells us, and most of you can quote this, I will lift up mine eyes into the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. Will you seek him this morning? Will you look unto the hills today for your help and where it comes from. In other words, I am literally calling on people to pray. Amen. That at the end of this service, or you can right now, that I'm literally going to give you an opportunity and call you to prayer to say, Lord, I'm going to seek your face for this, whatever that might be. I'm going to seek your face for a situation I'm facing at work. I'm going to humble myself and recognize that it is you that I need to turn to and I'm going to seek your face this morning for this, whatever that might be. And so we have to realize, we have to humble ourselves, we have to recognize that it's him that we need to seek. And thirdly, we need to repent. He says, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and then... Turn. And if you look up the definition for repent, that word, I mean, there's a couple of different ones there, but in the Webster's Dictionary, that literal word turn is in there. It means to turn from our sin. And so I'm going to say something that is, is 
unfortunately not preached. I'm not, I'm certainly not the only one, but it isn't preached enough. Maybe even I don't preach it enough. Stop asking God to help while you sit in sin. Now I'm not talking, now listen, I'm not talking about the world. I'm not talking about unbelievers, okay? I'm not talking about people that don't know the Lord. I don't care what you're sitting in. You come to him and you, you fall before the Lord and his grace will cover. His grace will save. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care how low your life is. God loves you. We love you. And he'll wash away Amen. all your sin. But too many of the church and too many people out in the world just want to continue to live the way they're living and then expect God to do something on their behalf. God is not calling us into some sort of perfection. We don't reach some, well, here, I'm holy enough now. Now God's going to answer all my prayers. That's not what I'm talking about, and you know it. I'm talking about a willful disobedience when God has, has absolutely placed his finger on something in your life that you need to correct, that you need to do, and you continue to live with that sin in your life. Let's see here. Humble yourselves. Pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. Committing a sin. Listen closely. Committing a sin and living in a state of sin are two totally different things. Because we are all going to fall short of the glory of God. We are all at times going to fail and fall in sin. That is, I am referring to continually living and accepting things that are sinful in our lives. And can I just stop? I know I've said this before. I'm just going to say it again. For, for goodness sake, let, let me step outside here of the pulpit. As a Christian, can I just talk about social media just for a little bit? I know sometimes people have enough good sense not to post inappropriate things or things that are contrary to the scripture or whatever. But be careful what you like to. Like there are things I see people post and then I see the people that like it. I'm like, what is there to like about that? Amen. I'm not talking about political junk. I'm just talking about things that are by nature sinful and people like that. I'm like, I get it. It's just a button, right? I think that's what people think. It's a button. It is literally testifying, I like that. Amen. I told you before. I mean, because look, I got nothing. Bethany knows, the, here's my phone. She knows the code of my phone. And we've been in the car before. She's like, let me see your phone. And I see her over on my phone on Facebook. And I'm like, don't like anything. Because she might just be, oh, that's, you know, a cute picture of, of something I shouldn't be liking on Facebook. Amen. And it's going to show up as me. I've seen her over there. And I'm like, don't, don't like anything. That's me, not you. That seems silly, right? But isn't it not a representation of what I agree together with somebody to say I like that or I don't like that? Okay, so we need to turn from those things. And we are, we're growing as a people and, we, and we're growing as a church and people are coming, but we are never going to do that at the expense of the truth that God is calling us into a life of righteousness and holiness. And it is something no matter how long we serve the Lord, we'll never reach, we're never going to reach perfection and we're all going to have things that we're working on and God is working on and through us to, to do I know you all think that, that my mom and Debbie are just perfect, holy creatures that could never possibly sin. But that's not true. It's just not. It's almost true, but it's not. You see, we still preach on sin. And I know there are people that think, and we, we have been very successful at this church, and God is continuing to grow. It's just amazing. And I, I've been there. I've heard those conversations. Leave, I've, not, not about our church, but I've heard him say it about other places before. When a church is growing, and one of the first things they'll say is, well, they, they, 
they must not be holding the standard down there. They must not be preaching the truth down there because how else are they growing? Or people show those, you know, they'll show a, a stadium full of people, 50, 60, 100,000 people, and an empty church. Well, I've seen empty stadiums too, Amen. right? I mean, just because a place is full and growing doesn't mean they're not speaking the truth. Okay, I can't explain it, why one church grows and one church doesn't. I, I don't always have the answers. It's not about my ability. It's not about our talent. I don't know. But I know this. We've had faithful people pray and pray and pray. And some of you are here this morning saved by the grace of God and on your way to heaven because people here called out your name and faithfully got up in the middle of the night. They faithfully got on their knees. They faithfully sacrificed. They faithfully fasted and prayed until you got saved. That's the only thing I can tell you that happened and why God has blessed the way that he has. But I know this, we're never going to grow at the expense of preaching the truth. We're still going to call sin, sin, and we're still going to preach about hell that is still real. And we do it because we love people. We still want people to know there are consequences of their sin. Be not deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever a man soweth. That shall he also reap. If you sow in sin, you will reap in sin. If you sow in things of death, you will reap in things of death. We preach because we love. We tell people to turn from their sin because we love. Many, many years ago, maybe 20 years ago, my, my dad, I was raised, my dad loved to hunt. He, he really loved to fish. He, he, I should say he liked to hunt, but he loved to fish. And, and my dad raised my brother and I doing, doing all that stuff. It just never took with me. Um, once I found sports and then uh, girls, you know, I just didn't have much interest in, in that other stuff. But, but over the course of my life, there have been other times where I would, I would take a stretch where I would get into fishing or I would get into hunting for a while and, and then I, you know, again, I'd lose interest in it. But about 20 years ago, some guys I was working with, we got to fishing every once in a while. And, and so we were working second shift. We got off at work at 11 o'clock at night. We went down to the Greenup Dam to fish. So here it is by then. It's midnight or after. And we're fishing there at the, at the dam. <coughs> if you've ever been there, I mean, that water's spraying and splashing and churning. And there's, there's a rail. You're up on, this, uh, up, up on this ledge and there's a rail there. And then you can fish out over that. And there was this, these other people there and they had this little kid with them. I don't know. Maybe four, five, six years old. And that kid was just running everywhere. Well, everything there is like, it's like a boat ramp. If you've ever been on a boat ramp or anything that's in the water a lot, I mean, it's just slimy and slick. And that kid was running everywhere. It scared me to death. Because I thought, I'm going to be standing here and I'm going to see that kid slip and slide right under that rail. And if they do, they're gone. If you've ever been there, I'm like, I'd like to be a hero, but I'm not jumping in there. Maybe I shouldn't have told you that. You think bad of me. You've never been there. Any of you ever been there? Look over that. You're not jumping in there either. Now, if it was, maybe it was my own, right? It scared me so bad I couldn't stand it. After a while, I just said, guys, I'm going home. It made me so nervous that I was going to see that child slip. And I wanted to go to those parents and say, get a hold of that kid. Grab a hold of them and tell them to stand still. Or they're going to die. And sometimes we as the church, that's our role. It is because we love you and we love the people in here. We are telling them that hell is a real place. And only by the grace and the blood of Jesus Christ can we escape that place. That he has called us out of that old life into a new life. Amen. And we tell people, we warn them to turn from that old life because we love them. Not only do we need to realize and recognize and repent, we know he gives us this promise if we do this. It says, and turn from your wicked ways, then, then, remember, take care of these things. If you do these things, then 
Will I hear from heaven? God is saying, I am always here. I am always and I am never changing. I am always where I can hear you. He says, and will forgive their sin and heal their land. He says, then will I hear from his place of stability and the place that he has always been. He will forgive and heal. I told Bethany this just a couple weeks ago and then I'm closing. If you guys, if you want to come and get a verse of song ready. I've shared this before this, and some of you have heard this even apart from me. My dad's favorite joke really wasn't a joke, but he would tell this about the man and woman that had been married a long time. And they were, they pulled up to a red light and they happened to look at the car beside them. There was a young couple. So they were an older couple. There was a young couple part beside him at the red light and she was just squished right up against him in that front seat of that car. And they looked over and the wife said, isn't that sweet? She said, do you remember when we used to ride like that? And the husband said, I didn't move. If you're feeling that there's a distance between you and God, let me assure you this. God's not the one that moved. God is still in the same place, which is everywhere. God is still upon his throne. He's still calling you. He still desires you. And if you feel that distance or if you've never known, then it is you, friend, that is no longer in the place that you used to be. And you can control and you can take care of that this morning by humbling yourself, by recognizing and repenting. And you can find yourself back in closeness with God. As we stand this morning, heads are bowed and eyes are closed.